I'll get really close to the mic to emphasize the bass. This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. They have a terrific lineup of live courses you can attend either online or in person. They also have a terrific backlog of courses you can watch, including JavaScript The Good Parts, Build Web Applications with Node.js, AngularJS in depth, and Advanced JavaScript. You can go check them out at frontendmasters.com. This episode is sponsored by CodeShip.io. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test passed? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied into a nice continuous integration system? That's CodeShip. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically. For fuss free continuous delivery, check them out at CodeShip.io. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Component One, makers of Widgmo. If you need stunning UI elements or awesome graphs and charts, then go to Widgmo.com and check them out. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 130 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Dave Smith. Hello, world. Jameson Dance. Hi, friends. AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live yet again from San Mateo, California. Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and I just have to point out that AJ, every time he's on, says, hey, coming at you live, and he's never coming at you live. Never once have we ever been. We've live. not ever done a live show. I'm All here live. right he's just now. Not in person. Yeah, he's live this, and in person, and we recorded this a week ago. When you're getting this, oh, I see. Not actually live. <laughs> totally not live. Well, maybe he's saying that he is alive at the moment they listen to the show, but that seems like a promise that he may not be able to guarantee. I wish he could. Depends how the show goes. <laughs> Chuck, do you use Bluebird. Chuck, do you have a cold? I have a cold. I may not talk a lot. You sound like you have a cold. Yeah, my voice is kind of going away. So, yeah, so I may just let you guys talk, but we'll see. I always have something to say, so I might just rasp it out. So you want to kick out our, our topic today? Yeah, let's talk about browser tools and extensions. So Yay. I want to start off on a tangent. Um, you want to introduce the topic? Yeah, yeah, we're talking about this. All right, let's get on a tangent. This was part of my plan to talk about my favorite thing in the world, which is Dota. Just kidding. Um, so I, I sit right now by a bunch of iOS developers, Ew. and it's really interesting to see the contrast between the workflow of iOS developers and the general web developer workflow. And they're fantastic developers. They're some of the brightest people I've ever worked with. Do you mean a lot like of their, the edit, compile, test workflow? No, just more like how much space in their brain Xcode takes up and oh. an interface builder. Their work is dominated to a way I feel like web development isn't by interacting with tools that make them more efficient. And there's a lot of yak shaving involved in that too, but it's just a really interesting contrast for me where I feel like I'm kind of typing or staring at a web page or looking at a debugger in the console or something, but they're like reading up on preferences in Xcode and trying to find cool hidden features like that <laughs> dramatically increase their efficiency. They were already there that they just didn't know about. So, you know what that makes me think of Jameson, that what? they are like Sigourney Weaver in aliens in that load lifter thing at the very end. And where you she fights the alien. in it. Yeah. And Jameson is the mother alien, just raw strength, natural power. Where <laughs> no, they're no using... tools required. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what this is. But Joe, really, if you could choose, wouldn't you go with the robot thing? I know I would. I kind of would. How I awesome is that? Yeah. Well, especially yeah, if Jameson, kind of a... Jameson's trying to implant some egg in your chest or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think the mother alien just straight up murders people. She's not. She's, she's not up for egg planting. Yeah, she's past that phase. Yeah. But. I bring that up to say that first, because I wanted to hear an analogy about aliens, but secondly, because <laughs> you got it, <laughs> I feel like that's something I personally could do better is spend more time obsessing about the tools I use and yeah, trying to you know, get little efficiencies and stuff. As web developers, we have so much choice in our tools. Yeah, you know? it's maybe a lot broader knowledge, but less deep about specific tools. Even so our this... platform where we execute our code is a choice, you know? Yeah. iOS developers, like, they pretty much have to use iOS. We can yeah. use almost any operating system and half dozen browsers. 
Yeah, and to play into the stereotype, I mean, my options, I can use Emacs, or I can use Emacs, or I can use <laughs> Emacs, you know, because it does everything. <laughs> Is it a browser, too? Uh, it can be. <laughs> does it come with that smug, superior attitude included, or do you have to install that separately? It's part, oh, no, that of, it's part of the license. That's, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Jameson, there's your, here's your challenge, then. For the next week, you can't do anything if you don't do it inside either Grunt or Gulp. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about browser tools I'm actually pretty excited about this topic because every once in a while I take time away from my own desk and shoulder surf other people and I always learn something about oh I didn't know you could do that or I didn't know that tool existed level think- 2 of that is called pair programming yeah yeah exactly I don't do that very much so <laughs> I mean I guess we could just start off talking about the built in developer tools in every browser all the browsers have them I use Chrome, so I know there's the best, but I know Safari and Firefox and IE all have their dev tools. Yeah. Do we want to talk about like? Do you know that they have dev tools? Because I, I don't know that they have dev I tools. I do know. They I do. do know that those three mm-hmm. that were mentioned do have dev tools. Yes. So, Dave, tell us about these unheard of dev tools. Why so would anybody use them? I'm going to state an opinion that might get me a little bit in trouble, but here's basically why anyone would use them. They are almost as good as Chrome's dev tools. <laughs> <laughs> well that's a good start because if the browser doesn't use all 16 gigs of RAM and I can debug with it that's a bonus the built in dev tools in Firefox have gotten really good I've been super happy with them there's just a few little things I find myself not being able to do but largely they're pretty good I've been pretty happy with them okay so two things I've noticed about Firefox dev tools one when you have some sort of flow where a window closes, like OAuth, the developer console still stays open in Firefox, which is very nice, as opposed oh, to yeah. Chrome. When the window closes, it closes, so you lose that opportunity oh. to debug. What can you do with the dev tools on a closed window? I don't know, because I, I haven't actually <laughs> needed is to it, do Is it just like null pointer exceptions all over the place? Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I just used it to see that you know, things took place correctly, and it turned out that when I was using Firefox, oh. I no longer had problems. At so that you point. could, like, for example, you could post mortem your console output and see if everything happened the way you thought. Is that kind of the yes. idea? Okay. Yes, because when you're doing OAuth and you have these refreshes, oh, and yeah. closing yeah. windows, and that's like really annoying if you lose that and you're trying to debug, like, did the correct values get passed to the window like I was expecting kind of thing? That's, that's super cool. All right, I'll put one point on the scoreboard for Firefox, on the official Pro, scoreboard. Um, pro tip. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Another point for Firefox is if you're doing anything with the web audio API. Jordan Santel and some other people with him are working on developer tools that visualize the graph of nodes in the web audio API and let you manipulate them graphically, which is super cool. Cool. Huh. All right, so I'm just going to throw out a random tip that I uh, discovered probably a couple years ago, but it seems like a lot of people I run into don't know about it. It's in Chrome, when you have the developer tools open on the network tab, this is the tab that shows all of the HTTP requests that the browser is doing. There is a little checkbox at the top of that called Preserve Log. About a year ago, it was just a red circle. And um, that red circle now means something else. But now it says Preserve Log. And the reason this is cool is because if you have a page navigation in the middle of your app for whatever reason, like a window.location change, by default, Chrome will clear out all of your, your HTTP request history out of that panel, and it's gone. But if you have the Preserve Log checked, it'll keep it. And that's really handy if you have like a redirect in your app, so it's bouncing between pages or something, and you want to see what the heck it was doing before it redirected. It can be frustrating when your history disappears, but with that checkbox, it'll stay. Oh, yeah. very nice. Where's uh, that bad boy? Uh, on the network panel, it's right at the top, right under the word network, oh, yeah. actually, on my display. Preserve and, log. So Firefox also has that feature, but they have another feature, which is, I think, more like a by default, log your requests at all. It just shows that it happened, but it doesn't show you the body or the contents or any debugging information that would be useful. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So one thing I want to talk about is just basically in all of these different tools, including IE, I might point out, they all have some features in common. 
Uh, one of them is that you can set breakpoints, and then you can inspect the state of the world so you can see what the different variables are, what their values are, yeah. what the objects are. You can drill down into them. You can see what values have been closed over. You can see what values are within the current closure and which ones are, are uh, global. And, uh, you know, so, so just some general browsing functionality that you can get that you would probably be used to using in an IDE if you're yeah. used to that in other languages. But in this case, it's just built into the browser so you can actually get a handle on what's going on in your program at any given point. So if you haven't used that feature before, I found in Chrome it's a little bit non-intuitive to locate it. You guys tell me if you have the same experience, but it's under the Sources tab, mm -hmm. right? That's how you access your code, your, your source code. Your breakpoints, yeah. So if you want to put in a breakpoint, you have to click Sources, and then you open the source file. And then you um, click in the gutter uh, where the numbers yeah. are for the line numbers. Yeah, most important thing there is to know that the Control-O keystroke lets you find the script yes. file you're looking for. yes. Super important. Totally. But the much easier way to do that is to just put in a debugger statement in your code and then have it open it for you and then set the breakpoint and take your debugger statement out and then do it again. And now you have the breakpoint where you want it rather than trying to find it in your code. Because it's yeah. usually a way too big of a pain in the butt to find it. That's my yeah. point. How do you yeah, put a debugger true. statement in there? Just the word debugger, D-E-B-U-G-G-E-R. You put that anywhere, it's a command, it's a JavaScript command, and it will launch the debugger in browsers. Ooh, I just learned something. Yeah, and I think that works in Node as well, right? Is does it really? That would, that's awesome if it does. What does it do in Node? I, I actually don't know. I don't know. We're going to need verification. Let <laughs> me open up my terminal here. If only we and... had Tim Caswell on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. While AJ is checking out the debugging thing, there's a little async checkbox on the call stack in the Chrome DevTools. Does that preserve the call stack through async operations? Is that what that does? Ooh, I don't know. I'm going to give you a completely honest answer. I have no clue. I'm going to assume it does, and if so, that the is The Googles rad. have the answer. It is Both? a powerful feature that makes JavaScript... Oh, wait, no, that's something else. <laughs> <laughs> Both yes. Chrome and Firefox added long stack traces. You can that's view the full cool. call stack of asynchronous JavaScript callbacks. Huh. Fancy. Woo. That's way cool. Because that's a big pain sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So, totally. so to, to explain what we're talking about here, imagine if you did an AJAX request and that AJAX request was initiated and it had a call stack at the time it was initiated, but when it returns, that call stack is lost. So when you get a breakpoint or something that would cause, you know, your debugger to come up, you can't tell who started this AJAX request. You can just say, oh, it'll just show like, oh, this came from some internal thing, right? But yeah, with that, apparently it will show the full and, initiation sequence of how you got here, which is really cool. I've not yeah, used that. Because that's a problem super common with Angular, jQuery, any framework. Because, you know, the yeah. AJAX stuff is so far down in the framework code that you never tell Yeah, Even if you're not using a framework, I think it's still a problem, right? Yeah, Some promise libraries support this, but generally it's opt-in, and it generally comes at the cost of higher memory of CPU usage. So the oh. fact that your dev tools could do this is really nice because that way you can not worry about the efficiency hit by like leaving that in in production or something. And then when you're debugging, you just turn it on. Super cool. While we're talking about breakpoints, there's another thing that I've found really useful. We've just been talking about breakpoints in your JavaScript code, but you can also put breakpoints in your DOM. So you can say, anytime someone what? modifies an attribute on this element, make it a breakpoint, and then you can see what JavaScript is doing that and figure out why that just happened. You That's can do attribute cool. modifications, subtree modifications, or node removal in Chrome. Yeah. Does really Firefox cool. do the same thing? Let's find out. I'm not seeing a break on in Firefox. One point for Chrome on the official scoreboard. Yeah. <laughs> Firefox will let me delete the node, though. So, uh, bad news for node. When you statement, it does nothing. Debugger. The debugger statement is ignored? Yep. I wonder if you have to run node yeah. in a certain mode to get it. Yeah, that's true. Let's do node dev. I actually do very little node development, so anything Jim I say Jameson's should be... Jameson's our node expert. So AJ is too. Node has a debugger mode. The only way I've ever used it is to hook it up to the Chrome debugger. But I imagine if you run it with a debugger thing, 
the debug flag enabled that the debug command in your JavaScript would do something different. Jason. I want to stop talking about things I don't know about yet, though. Do you do N- Node Inspector? No, I've used it a couple times, but I use Jameson Inspector. <laughs> That's where I just look at the code and put in print lines and then sit and think. Okay, Thank you for so... saying that, because I feel so low rent that I do that. <laughs> low rent. <laughs> Jameson Inspector? So there's a book called yes. Coders at Work, and it has interviews with a lot of famous, What's successful name? software developers from anywhere from the beginning of computers to the 80s and 90s. Cool. And it seems like it's a pretty even split between people who use debuggers and people who use print lines. Oh, and it's interesting. Like Donald Newth, right? Like it's these super brilliant, successful, technically accomplished people. It's also a pretty even split between testing and not testing too. Wow. Which might rustle some jimmies, but I'm so glad to hear that because I've really been a print line debugger predominantly in my life. You and Donald Newth. Oh, he and I are buds now. Yep. For me, I tend to do the same thing, but you know, so I, I have I put alert in, you know, when I'm debugging in the browser. Oh, that's low rent. Come on. You, you, you do alert? <laughs> well, or, yeah, or console.log. I've done We're both. not friends anymore. But <laughs> No, well, well, alert is my debug statement too, because it halts execution and allows me. Right. <laughs> oh, but, Donald Newth is so ashamed of you. But the thing is, is that, <laughs> you know, sometimes I really do need to just stop and inspect stuff, and so then I will go use the debugger. So De- I think I'm. Debugger kind of a, statement. The debugger statement. That's your friend now. I'm, you yeah, it, it is now. But my, yeah, because then I can just put it in where I want to halt the world and see what's going on. But the thing is, is that it's usually a situational thing. And if I can't find the problem within a few, you know, console.logs or alerts, yeah, then it's like, okay, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to step through it and figure out where it's breaking. Yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely application for both. I have to say one thing that Chrome Web Tools does that drives me absolutely bonkers and I'm, I don't know if the other browsers have this problem, but if you don't have the dev tools open when yep. you're, when you hit an error, you don't get a backtrace. It makes me so angry. Oh, I'm like, I oh, I gotta go and freaking reload because it didn't show up. Yeah. Now yeah, you know. That's interesting. Yeah. I almost <laughs> always just keep them open for that reason. And also because it also doesn't collect network requests. Yeah. When it's not open. So I just yeah, keep it annoying. open. I am excited, ahead, though, that Chrome recently added the emulation thing to it. It was only in Canary. Because yeah, that's amazing. That. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah. What was funny is I read this somewhere. I think I was looking at a course on hybrid development, and they were talking about, oh, get Canary so that you can have emulation mode so that you can emulate at least the screen size of de- different devices. And they have in there built in like a gazillion different devices, and you can just pick the device, and it will put your browser as if it were that screen size and give you like rulers and things so you can see what it, what the website looks like in that browser. And I did that and downloaded Canary and then all of a sudden it was showing up in my regular Chrome and I thought, wow, did like Canary add a tool to Chrome? But no, it just, they just released it for Chrome. And it's this little, in the upper left corner in your developer tools right next to the little magnifying glass is now a little thing that looks like a small phone. And that's the emulation for. Oh, that looks devices. really good. Man, great job, Google. Yeah, Google's doing something nice. This is really cool. Yeah. yeah I have clicked that before, and it didn't look this cool last time. (laughs) (laughs) This is really nice. Another really cool feature that we haven't talked about um, in the Chrome DevTools is the timeline view, which shows you, you can view the memory usage and the basically frames per second and painting performance and stuff like that as you manipulate your web app. And it's really helpful for debugging memory leaks and performance problems, like issues with janky scrolling or clunky animations or things like that. So I have to say that every time I go in there and use it, it's like learning the entire set of tools again. Yeah, I've had the same experience. Where they change it all the time, you mean? Well, it changes a lot, and it's really complicated, too. Yeah. It's got a lot of moving parts. You know, I just tried it again for the first time in a while, and it looks awesome. I think they've made it better. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's like they're it, working on it. Like you said, it just it has so many moving parts that I feel like if I'm not using it every day, I'm only using it uh, you know, a few times a year, half a dozen times a year, something like that. Every time I open it up, I feel like I got to learn this entire tool again. I don't remember how I did this before, and it's so complex. Maybe that means so, you should be using it more, Joe. 
I think may, that's what that it may means mean for that. Me. That may mean that. So the patron saint of browser developer tools is Adi Asmani. Right. I mean, he's a Google employee, so he's kind of biased towards Chrome DevTools. But if you want to keep up on all the haps with the browser tools, he's the person that you follow on Twitter or read his blog articles or whatever. Yeah. Um, he has really good info on how to use them. So what is the, um, what is the name of that term, that process where you, somebody actually becomes a saint in the Catholic Church? What's that? Uh, I don't know. Sanctification? Yeah, maybe that's it. I don't know. There's a there's definitely a term for it. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's been official yet or for Addy. <laughs> canonized. <laughs> canonized. Yes, they are. They're canonized. Yes. Yeah, I think he's been canonized at Google. I believe he has. So uh, I have a little story about the timeline view. About two years ago, we were just getting into Angular JS at my job, and uh, we were really using it extensively. And we used it kind of recklessly and without really being careful about performance at all. And after about three or four months, we realized that some of our pages were slow and janky. And I opened up the timeline view for the first time. I hadn't really used it. Every single entry on the timeline was the digest loop. And that's where I got to learn <laughs> what the Angular digest loop was <laughs> a couple of years ago. So uh, it wasn't terribly helpful, but it pointed me in exactly the right direction. Like your digests are slow. It couldn't tell me why, but it could tell me that that's what it was. And that was pretty cool. That's nice. So... I wanted to take a step back for just a second. I heard somebody was mentioning about the little phone icon in Chrome and how it lets you have a uh, a nice mobile applications. Mm-hmm. Take a look at the one that Firefox has. It's the icon is not as clear. The icon looks like square inside of a larger bordered maybe oh, a little dot. Is it the one that it? says responsive design mode is the tooltip? Yes. And it's got a oh. drop down. Oh. But that this one, isn't as cool. No. Well, the, the new, <laughs> the new Chrome one has a lot more gizmos on it. But the old Chrome one wasn't very usable, the one from like six months ago. But the one in Firefox is very simple, very clean, very easy to understand. Like I really liked it when I first saw it. And then somebody showed me one in Chrome, and I didn't really use it because it wasn't as good at the time. How do I but add course, a custom size to it? Uh, you just pull it out. You, so there's you drag, a drop down where you, you drag can, it and then it says custom, but you, oh, and then you say add preset and you oh, can name add it. Preset. Yep. Oh, that's and, cool. uh, thanks, AJ. Firefox OS, I think, is probably the inspiration for Firefox having such great mobile development tools quicker. Okay. And here's but, something cool, too, AJ, on that same feature. There's a little camera icon right there. Do you see that? Yeah. And you, you click it and it takes a screenshot and just saves it to your downloads folder instantly. Yep. That's very convenient. But it's cool because it gets the right dimensions, so it you know, it gets exactly the content area. And it has the touch event simulator. Oh, hello. I don't know if the Chrome one has that or not. You know, this is a pro tip for anybody on a Windows box, but the whole OneNote screen capture, I feel like this makes some of the things like that completely unnecessary because I can just capture just the area that I want super easy. Is there a tool like that for the Mac? Uh, where you can click and drag a window, an yep. area. Yeah, yep. you have Screen to hold cap. Control, Command, Shift, and 4. Yep, Command, Shift, <laughs> 4. And if you hit space, then it'll capture the whole window. Yeah. All right. Okay, I remember that now. It's okay. A, and, no, I was just saying, it's been a long time since I've done serious amounts of work on my Mac. I use my, I still use my Mac, but I don't do nearly as serious stuff as I used to a while ago. Let's talk about the JavaScript console. Yes. Do you guys use this? I All do. the time. Yes. I we're, probably we're, use this more than any other dev tool built into the browser. We're console loggers. I usually try to create a macro in every editor that I use that CL is console.log. Oh, cool. But, and then in the console itself, there's a bunch of cool tools too. So I want to throw out a, a tip. Console.dir. D-I-R. Console.dir? Yeah, yeah. What is that? Because I've it's, seen it, but I've never seen it. It's when you're it. logging out something and log will oftentimes, basically, it'll two-string whatever it is you throw in there. And so console.door will force it to basically create, explore, give you an explorable object. Oh, okay. So every so, time you log and you don't get an explorable object, try dir instead, and you might get the explorable object. Oh, interesting. Oh, now, now this is crazy. This is crazy. You might not know about this. This, I think, is new. In Chrome, whenever you console.log something, it gives you array and then, like, the number of elements in it or object or whatever. If you right-click or... Mm-hmm. Two finger click and select store as global variable. It gives you a oh variable my. temp one, temp two, temp three. <laughs> so you can explore the object and play with it in the global scope. 
Oh my so, gosh. So you could, wow. <laughs> that, that's so super cool. Lifesaver. Super you know, cool. So say you want to, you want to call some function on a method, like say it's an angular, right? Deeply nested scope. You can console.log it, but you know, it's difficult to get at. You can console.log your objects. Then you can variable and then you can call the function that you need that will operate in the scope of that controller. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's as if it, you just literally declared a global variable and pointed it at that variable in your scope. And so you yep. can manipulate it and it will be manipulated within the scope that it actually belongs. Oh, super mm-hmm. cool. Nice pro tip. Here's one for you, a little pro tip that I don't use very often, but I saw just recently. Console.table. Have you guys seen this one? No. Let's say you have a REST API that returns an array of objects that all have similar keys. If you console.table that array, you will get a rendered table where it Chrome figures out the keys and turns those into column headers and then uh, displays it. Wow. So for an array of objects. Yeah. Huh. I'm going to test this out right now. Yeah. So this isn't fancy or revolutionary or whatever, but the main thing I use the dev console is for is when I do dip into a debugger, just to poke around it, yeah, stack and all the variables and things in context and examine yeah. things. People might not know that they're linked up, but when you're in a breakpoint, you can open up the console and you can run code in mm-hmm. the context of where the breakpoint happened. Now, mm-hmm. I can't get this particular feature to work in Firefox. Do you, do you so know how to do table? that? No, the, what uh, Jameson just talked oh, about. Oh, I don't. Use Firefox. <laughs> Sorry. I use it when I'm doing web audio stuff, and that's about it. So for those that do use Firefox, why? Like, what got you back to Firefox? I don't think any of us use it as our primary browser. Oh, it's yeah. just me. Never? I never have. I know someone who has. I could ask them later and tell you. I used to. I went through a transition when I was, you know, even for a Microsoft developer, we quickly had to go to Firefox, and I don't know, it was around 2001 or something like that. And then to use that for our dev tools because it just had superior dev tools at the time. And then a little bit later, Chrome, we went, I switched to Chrome because it was a lot faster and I haven't switched back, but I hear a lot of people saying that Firefox is really back to being as fast as Chrome, yeah. if not faster. And okay. So here's the cool console feature as long as we're still talking about it. I've got one particular page in my current app at work that's really chatty on the console and it logs hundreds of messages when you load the page. At the top of the console, there's a little funnel icon. It's gray, and if you click on it, it expands down a little panel below it, and it's got a filter. Mm -hmm. And you can type text into that filter, and only messages that match that text will be displayed in the console. And it truly is just a filter. It's not a search feature. It filters down the output, so you can like prefix your console messages in your app, and then you can filter it down that way. And I think it should be a law that all filters support this. It has a regex checkbox next to it, so you can do more complicated matching. I've yeah, been lobbying one, my congressman for that. <laughs> the one in Firefox Regex. Or maybe it does. Let me, let me just try and see. So another nope. another random fact about the console is it used to be that when you logged out objects in Chrome, since it kept a reference to the object around, so you could open up the object and examine its properties and stuff, it would keep a reference in memory to that object, which could cause problems if you were oh, trying to find memory leaks or things like that. So yeah. now they have a little, I think it's like a button or a link or something. When you log out an object, there's a thing you can click to say, keep this around, and then it says, like, this will be kept in memory. Oh. That bit me pretty hard once when I was doing a demo about debugging memory leaks in JavaScript. And I... Fix the code to change the leak, and I printed out a variable, and it was still there. And <laughs> I looked really dumb in front of everybody. But, but that's I don't why. see that option in the right-click menu when I right-click on a console.logged. Mm, uh, let me use the magic of Google while someone else talks. Have you had the experience when you console.log an object, and then after the console.log has happened, the object's value changes, like say one of the keys on it changes values, that in the log oh. it retroactively updates to display it? Display yeah. the uh, new one. Yes. Okay, yeah. so that's that's a pro that tip. That has killed you, me before. Yeah, because you can look at something and you're actually seeing the new value, not the old value. Right. This is where Angular.copy comes in really handy. I will often do console.log, Angular.copy, my object. And then you've got an immutable, you know, this or rather, it's immutable at least in the console. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I've done JSON.stringify. Got a, get a snapshot a of it is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah, JSON.stringify would do the same thing. So keep that in mind with console.log. It can be really frustrating if you don't know. 
Although that hasn't happened to me in a long time. I wonder if Chrome changed its behavior. No, it happens to me. Yeah. I just I don't make those same mistakes as often. Ah, <laughs> you guard against it. I, I think that's what I've started doing. I'm pretty sure the tool still works the same. It's just I've encountered that problem enough that I've started rewriting my brain to always... Yeah, me too. Yeah. Is there anything else we should talk about on the console? I feel like Chrome recently fixed that, though, where they capture the state when you first examine it instead of keeping a reference to it. Well, that would have fixed your demo. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, because like, there's some things where you want to get the new state. Like, for example, if you just do a jQuery AJAX call, it returns an XHR object. If you console.log that, like, you want to be able to play with it in its current state with the response data, etc. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, it could be a feature. It could also be a surprising feature. <laughs> Well, I wanted to ask specifically about what browser extensions you guys are using in oh. addition to the console. I have a few that I use pretty regularly. One of them is Pretty Jason. Oh yeah, I love that one. Oh my gosh. Yep. I mean, the only downside is that if so I'm usually working on a Rails backend and if it gives a response like an error response or anything that isn't JSON, then it just gives you the the general this isn't valid JSON instead of showing you the page, which usually, in the case of Rails, gives you some kind of stack trace and other good debugging information. Oh, yeah. But other than that, I love it. I, Me too. I It is so nice. That's the one that has, it will catch the eye of your coworkers if they see you looking at so, that one? Yes. Because what it does is it nicely indents and nests your objects. So, and it colorizes them, too. Yes. So Super it, nice. It's It's very, very nice. So instead of seeing just a gigantic page full of JSON, like all minified looking, yeah. you get this explorable, expandable, collapsible, color coded JSON. It's more of, it looks a lot more like what's in the Chrome console when you console.log an object. Super nice. Yeah. You don't have this wall of text that you have to parse visually. You have yeah. other options, which is very handy. I'm glad you brought that up because that's one that I have installed and I just forget about it. And then every once in a while, I browse to one of my API endpoints directly in the address bar, and I'm like, "Oh, I What's love the name my of that life. one again." Pretty, pretty Jason. Pretty Jason. So hey, I can been... I can confirm that yes, if you log out an object and it changes, you'll see the updated value, even though it was old when you logged it out. Okay. Maybe with it, the magic <clears throat> of editing, Chuck can it make it. It depends. Go Sorry. away, so I don't sound dumb. <laughs> it it, de well, it actually not. depends. If your object's small enough that it can just basically write it out as text and write the whole entire thing out in the console, it will. But if it's so big that it gives you a little explorer where you have to click the little arrow and it opens up and expands, then that is the live value. You're just looking at the live object, whereas, or at least a, a pointer to the live object, right? So it captures yep. the live object at that time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it just if it's very small, if it only has it's an object with like just two or three properties, then it just writes the whole thing out there, and then it's basically just it's almost like two stringing it at that point. Oh, interesting. So it's actually really tricky. Yeah, it is tricky. You, you can't tell which whether it's going to do that or not. Yeah, you can't guarantee it one way or the other. All right, I have an extension that I really like. It's called Edit This Cookie, uh -huh. and uh -huh. it puts a little cookie icon in your Chrome toolbar. And when you click it, it shows you all the cookies that this particular website has written. And you can edit them right there in line um, in a little popover UI that's super nice. And you can delete them. So if you're playing with your app and you've got like a session cookie or something, you can mess with it right there. You can look at the expiration on it. You can look at the flags, like whether it's HTTP only or secure. And uh, it really helps you get visibility into what your cookies look like. I just open up the cookies and set role to admin on every site. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, weird that's why that I that's... encrypt my cookies on the websites that I work on. It's weird to me that that's not built into the dev tools either. Yeah, you can I view the, the cookies, thought. but you can't edit them. It, can you see all the properties on the cookies too? Like the yeah, where do, you, where do you see that? It's in the resources tab in the Chrome Dev Tools, yep. and then there's oh. a cookies thing. I see, but you can't. You can only delete things. You can't change them, from what I can tell. At the end of the show, we need to have a section on. All the stuff in the Chrome DevTools I never click on. <laughs> so I'm going to steal the conch again to talk about the Profiles tab and the cool. Audits tab in the Chrome DevTools. Those are profiles, two. Profiles, 
is what you use to determine. So the timeline tab is what I use to see if my memory usage is rising over time, but it's not a good tool for figuring out why it's rising. You can just see this line going up, but it's hard to tell what's causing it. With profiles, you can take heap snapshots, which is basically recording the contents of your heap. And then you can do a bunch of stuff in your app and then take another heap snapshot and you can diff the two. So you'll see objects that were allocated and not released between the two snapshots. And you can use that to try and find memory leaks. There's also CPU profiling, which I've found less useful, but I'm sure it could be helpful. And then the audits tab runs a bunch of automated performance testing on your site and on your running code. It's more generic. So it's a lot easier to use, but also less specific information. But it tells you things like optimize your images or minify your code or stuff like that. Just like general oh, yeah. good performance yeah. tactics. There used to be a plugin called PageSpeed, I think, that did stuff similar to this one. Looks mm-hmm. like maybe yeah, they... it looks like they rolled some of that in. It's kind of like that Y slow yeah. add on to yeah. that was around for a while. Yeah, very yeah. similar. It, These are good sanity oh, checks go to look at every once in a while. In yeah. Your app. The favorite one I just found is that it shows unused CSS rules. So you can oh, cool. see what portion <laughs> nice. of the CSS you have loaded isn't used on your current page. Oh, that's super cool. Nice. Anyways, that's all I got on the Chrome DevTools. I have one more extension. If you're an Angular JS developer, you uh, will probably benefit from having the Batarang extension installed. What it does is when you install it, it puts a little tab on your toolbar there in your dev tools right next to the console called angular js and i've actually not f- found it to be terribly useful in when i actually click on that tab and use things that are in there like model inspector and the relationship and dependency inspector and all that stuff but what i use it for is when you right click on a element on your page and say inspect element and then go highlight that element in the inspector then on the javascript console you can write dollar scope and you can inspect the scope of that element in your page and you can change it and you can read it to see what's going on and that has been really useful for me so i've been using yeah, ng inspector for a lot of the same stuff yeah oh, i cool. thought i thought the cool kids were all using ng inspector nowadays that does make sense i tend not to be one of those kids <laughs> so my hot tip for browser plugins is cloud to butt plus what? and it changes cloud, cloud to, to butt to, yeah like it your butt, the text, the cloud, with uh-huh. the text, my butt, huh. <laughs> and like it, it makes my life better every day. Okay, I'm installing that right now. I've got okay. a couple more that I want to share. Uh, one of them is mod header. What you can do is, if you're making requests to particular endpoints, then you can change the header to make so you can change the content type that you're requesting. Or you can change the agent, uh, the user agent, or other things. And you can then test endpoints with your browser to make sure that they respond appropriately to different values in the header. Another one that I also use, and this is another one that I use to test my APIs, is DHC, REST H- HTTP API client. Yeah. And you can actually use that to, again, hit uh, REST and HTTP endpoints. And, uh, you know, it's just a handy way of testing things out. And so you can actually get in, you can make the request. Again, you can change the headers and everything else that you're sending over, but this is controlling the entire request, including all the post data and everything else. And the nice thing is, is then you can verify. It's kind of like having a graphical interface on curl or uh, wget. Um, that's built into your browser so you can make those requests and you can send it exactly what you need and verify that everything is working the way that you want it to. So there's another add-in just like that called Advanced REST Client. And just it has actually more stars, like almost an order of magnitude more stars than that, what is it, DHC? I have that that one you were talking about, Chuck. But... This one comes up, has more downloads, more stars, and looks like it has I, exactly the same functionality. I use Advanced REST Client. They're all probably the same. Uh, the REST Client thing has history that stores all your requests. But the creepy thing about all these extensions is they ask for permissions to see all your data on every website you ever go to ever. And I just click yes and hope that no one tries to steal my life. <laughs> 
That's always the right That's, answer when someone asks. Yeah, data. I've never heard of advanced REST client. I've heard of. There's one called Postman. There are native apps that do the same thing, but they're all just every fancy wrappers around make, curl. Every step you take. Break it down. So there's, okay. <laughs> there's yeah. actually, um, Jameson, if you remember Spotter RF, I don't know if we did this when you were there, but we created a network debugger that was kind of like Postman, but also did oh, TCP yeah, I, and UDP. I do remember that. It's still getting updated. There were some commits pushed to it the other day, some bug fixes. Okay, so, I hate to. I is hate that to like rewind. Wireshark? Well, yeah, you Sharp. gotta you gotta explain that to people that don't. Okay, so James and I worked at a company called Spotter RF in uh, good old Orem, Utah, and it's a, a radar company. He kind of like took the whole space forward by using HTML5, what was available at the time, which was like we did some pretty cool stuff with it. And in order to help uh, ourselves and our clients, which a lot of Terry debug it because I mean these guys like. And see, you know, like what HTTP? Huh? Has that been around for thirty years? Did we invent that already? No, let's make a new protocol. So <laughs> we built this debugger that was similar to Postman, and it was called Netbug. And I'm going to see if I can like pull up the uh, GitHub repository for it. But you install it locally, and the protocols that we used on the device were um, HTTP because we did a lot of HTML5 and and JSON API stuff, and also um, UDP and TCP. And um, I haven't downloaded it recently to see what happened to it, but it was pretty cool when I was working there. And apparently they're still making updates to it. All right, I got to rewind a little bit. NG Inspector is so awesome. How did I not know about this? <laughs> I've been living in the past. I was such an early adopter with Batarang, and now I'm just left in the dust. It's the danger of early adoption. Dave has come out of the dark ages and into the Renaissance. I, know, so, right I, feel, so, I feel so wise. One and thing there's, that, there's one of these for every framework too. There's one for Ember and one for React. And yeah. it, I think that's a really cool trend that the frameworks are starting to delve into tooling, not yeah. just oh, making yeah. their frameworks good. Because one thing to such weird stuff these days. One thing to note: <laughs> I found that to be completely useless when on Plunker because Plunker is built in Angular. Oh, awesome! And so all of their spam and the inspector in there, inception. Yeah, you cannot get to what you care about because all of their stuff is just all, you know, it's a big, huge app with tons of scopes and you just can't find where where you need to be. I'll take that under advisement. Well, now you know. I think you're saying never use Plunker. No, I love Plunker. (laughs) It's It's definitely my favorite of the online coding tools. So which ones do you guys like? I think these kinds of tools are almost in the same category as browser dev tools and extensions. Yeah, I think I usually just plunk. use JS bin. JS bin, JS but fiddle. I'm not, yeah, I'm not religious about any of them. They all seem kind of the same to me. Okay. Are these companies or are these just hobby projects? I'm curious. I don't know. Which ones? I don't like know the either. JS bins and yeah, plunkers? Yeah, and plunker. I think it probably depends from project to project. Oh, there is one called CodePen that Chris Coyer, the CSS tricks. I like um, that one. That's more real time editing and collaboration. Yeah, and. It has a lot of the same features as all the other ones, but it's more the there's kind of a community around it of sharing wild CSS hacks or cool front end things. So I do Isn't like that, that one because it's the people who use it, not just the technology it has. Isn't that the one that you can share with other people and edit it in real time together? I think all of them you can mostly kind of do, do that. that. Oh, yeah. do they? Okay. CodePen might yeah. it might be a little bit more first class Code, there. Yeah, CodePen has some kind of aggregation and curation features though. Where you can oh, okay. have your code pen profile and see the top 100 code pens and stuff like that, which is kind of like, cool. If you just want to see the cool stuff people did. I like Plunker because you cool. can create more files into it rather than just stuck with just the, the three one for each. Yeah, three slash three the default ones. You can actually create your own files and name them. So you can take it beyond yeah, just the very very bare minimums of a demo project into something a little bit more complex. Yeah. So, so I like that. I'm starting to feel a little bit self-conscious. I was a little worried about this show because it's always a worry when you bring out these tools that you use and people tell you, oh my gosh, that is so 2013. <laughs> <laughs> you guys ever have that experience when you like with your coworkers or friends? Every day of my life. <laughs> yeah. It's so bad in the web development community. Actually, oh, it's it really great, I think, that we are like this. You know, We throw away our tools like every six months. They're old and busted. The worst is uh, working with Merrick <laughs> Christensen because he literally changes his editor every other week. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
I spent 10 years learning my editor. How could I? <laughs> it, it, it's not Emacs, though. So. <laughs> okay, other cool tools? I think it's also important to have a markdown previewer add-in. Okay. So, um, I... Just so if you end up viewing a markdown page, it'll preview it in nice-looking HTML. You can see how it's supposed to look down in an actual markdown preview. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I like markdown. I just don't use it that often in the browser, et cetera, et cetera. So... Ever heard of a little thing called GitHub? Oh, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I what? just commit it to GitHub and then go look at it. I mean, why complicate this? Okay, let's talk commit about... it to GitHub and look at it when you could just edit it in GitHub and look at it. Yeah, exactly. You've got too many steps. Can we talk about the element inspector in Chrome? Yes. yes. This is probably the one part of the Chrome dev tools that most people are already familiar with, but it's got some pretty cool stuff in it. No, console's definitely the number one. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. It's true. Then First of all, we should point out, you can open the Chrome DevTools with keystroke. And yes. on, on the Mac, it is command option I to open the element inspector. And then I think it is command option J to open the console directly. I don't know what it is on Windows, Joe. So it's pretty much the same keystrokes, except it's not command, it's control shift. Um, you got control shift I to just open it up. And then mm-hmm. control shift C gives you the inspector and I don't know if Control Shift J will get you to the yeah that gets you to the console. Control Shift J. Okay. So they, I think they mimic it. So you said yeah. I was the inspector, but I thought C was the inspector, and I was just to open up the tools. Uh, right click on the element it, you want to see, and the then last, and then pick Inspect Element, and that'll open it too. I yeah. opens you to C, the last. It looks tab like C that opens open to wherever you were last. Yeah, yeah. What Jameson said. That's, yeah. What did Jameson say? Command uh, option C. It opens the dev tools to whatever you were looking at previously. And command option I opens it to the ins- gives you the inspector and Yes, the element pick. inspector. Okay, so it's actually kind of backwards on Windows. That's weird. For some reason I have the missile memory depending on which box I'm on, because I use both my boxes, you know, roughly the same amount. So I don't ever get screwed up when I'm over on my Mac. Okay. Jameson is saying I'm lying, which is probably true. <laughs> anyway. This is something you can learn for yourself. It's homework. Okay, well, let's talk about the element <laughs> inspector though, because it's got some pretty it's got some pretty cool stuff. First of all, when you click on an element in the inspector, you can see its CSS properties, and you can edit those right there in real time. And there are two main sections to edit those CSS properties. There's one called element.style, which is the equivalent of putting a style attribute on the HTML element. But what's, I think, even more powerful is you can actually look at each of the rules that have been applied to this element, and you can edit those in line two. So, like, if you have a table with a bunch of rows, you can select one of the rows in the inspector and edit one of the class-based, say, for example, rules in the... You can edit the properties on that rule, and then all of the rows will update in real time to reflect the change you made, which is pretty cool. I guess most people have probably already done this. Well, the thing that's really cool about it is that you can tell Chrome to remember the change. You can effectively save it. You can either save it to your hard drive or you can commit the change, sort of. And then when you refresh, it'll keep those changes. How do you do that? I don't remember. I've only done it a few times. I know that you can save the CSS, the modified CSS, to your hard drive. So if you change the, the style, then you can save it to your system. And then you just go put it back into your project, if your project's on your hard drive. That's pretty cool, but have you ever had a case where you've got this saved CSS rule and it makes your app look different for you than everybody else? Yeah, I've also had plugins do that. So Yeah. One of the other things that's cool about the CSS display is to the right of those properties, or depending on your layout below them, you can see the box model, um, you can see the padding, the border, the margin, yes. and the position rules, and on the little numbers on those, or the hyphen if you don't have one, you can double-click it and change it right there visually. So instead of typing in the CSS rule, you can just go find the part of the box model you want to modify, like say it's the margin on the top, and just edit it, which is really cool. Hmm. I don't know that. You just double click on it. That's way cool. It's amazing that as much as I use this particular piece, there's still things I don't know about it. Yeah. Remember the iOS developers and how much time they spend on Xcode? I think they spend too much time, but I could spend more time on things. <laughs> That's nothing with the amount of time that I've seen people 
a.k.a. Merrick Christensen, spend in <laughs> chocolate trying to make it work exactly the way he wants it to work. Mm, I could spend more time with chocolate. <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> We're thinking of the wrong. We're talking about different chocolates. Oh, darn. Fine. Spoil do, my fun. See if Jameson, I do you know any iOS developers who don't use Xcode to build their apps? Is uh, that possible? I think I, I know, know one that uses that JetBrains yep. one. They're called hybrid developers. No, no, he's an Appcode. iOS developer. Appcode. Yeah, I think he uses AppCode. Yeah. But he also he values newness for its own sake, is a nice way to put it. Is newness he shunned is by the other developers? Oh, you can bet he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's got to be a cardinal know sin. Oh, yeah. They probably like won't let letter. him buy hush puppies at the store. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and then there are also all of the, the hybrid app frameworks that you've got out there. So, yeah. Okay. I've got one more Chrome extension if we have time. It's called Page Ruler. It's for Chrome. I'm sure there's others. When you click it, your cursor becomes a little crosshair and you can select a box on the page and it will tell you how wide it is, how tall it is, and where it's positioned top, right, left, and bottom. So it's cool for when you're just saying, hey, that box looks taller than that box, or they don't seem to be the same width. You can just measure it right on the uh, page, which is kind of cool. It's really great if you have a uh, keenly developed attention to pixel detail, which yeah. some people do, and I'm very fond of them, but I'm not one of them. There's, a, I think there's another add-in that a typical developer should have in, and that's a color picker. Yeah, yeah I definitely. Have, I have ColorZilla on mine. A little teardrop tool to say yeah. what color is that. Exactly. Yeah. And get it in all the different formats. Oh, can I tell you about one more as long as we're talking about pixels? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, this one is called Perfect Pixel. And if you're super obsessive about the just perfect pixel positioning, let's say you have a UX designer who gave you a mock-up, you can take this Perfect Pixel extension and you can browse for the mock-up file. Say it's like a PNG file. And then you can lay it over the top of your page and make it semi-transparent. Wow. So you can still see your page beneath it. And then you can start messing with your CSS and layout to try to get your page to line up perfectly, pixel for pixel, with the mock-up. Oh, nice. So if you have UX designers and you want them to just absolutely love you, do this, and they will think you are so cool. Wow. Oh, you mean those guys? Yes. Awesome. All right, well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Jameson, what are your picks? So one is an essay called Aboard Amtrak. It's kind of a long form essay about this writer's journey where they didn't have a house for a couple months and just used Amtrak. It's one of those uh, really hippie things that you can do when you have no responsibilities or people that depend on you and go do really fun things. But it's really well written. It kind of makes you wistful and nostalgic for the good old days and kind of Describes American culture in an interesting way. Huh. Um, just a beautiful piece of writing that has some really neat visual effects built into it. They do some cool stuff with the web. The other one is an article on how SQLite works. It does a very good job of making it appear simple to dig into the internals of these big hairy C or C++ projects. So someone was just playing with SQLite. They make a table. They kind of edit the source code to insert some tracing and debugging code. And just explore it to see what SQLite does when you make tables and when you make queries and how indexes work and things like that. And it, it was really interesting and kind of inspiring to think that I could do that with similar projects. And the last one, um, there are two books. The first one is called Blindsight. I may have picked it before, but I'm going to pick it again. The second one is called Echopraxia, and it's a sequel to the first to kind of near future science fiction books about alien encounters, but it's very hard sci-fi. So it's tries to take a very realistic look based on what we know about the brain and consciousness about what aliens would be like. And they focus a lot on, on the role of consciousness in intelligence. And I'm so used to those two things being the same, but kind of the, the main thesis of the book is that you can have intelligence without consciousness and you can have consciousness without intelligence. And the author explores those themes in interesting ways that are also very entertaining to read too. Those are my picks. All right. Uh, AJ, what are your picks? Okay. So 
One, there's this video that I had seen some time ago called Inventing on Principle, and I watched it due to a friend's recommendation. And it's really, really cool. It, it just got me, when we were talking about all this browser console dot logging stuff and all that, this guy, Brett Victor, poses the question, like, why can't we interact with code immediately? And he actually creates some prototypes where there's no difference between the debugging environment and the coding environment, and there's no running the code. He makes a change to the code, and it outputs the results in, like, the debugger is running live, so that as he makes an edit in the code, it goes back to the state where he was with that one change kind of thing. So I'd highly recommend watching it and just kind of thinking, like, how could we make design like this? And then another cool thing was I recently bought a Bravo Audio tube amp. And if you have uh, decent headphones that you could get a little bit more volume out of, except that you can't because your little tiny 8-inch iPod jack really isn't going to give it enough to experience their fullness if you wanted to experience their fullness in some sort of brain damaging way for example this tube amp is like super powerful and it just looks really cool the downside of it is that it it picks up cell phone interference like super easily so you can't have it anywhere near a cell phone otherwise while you're listening to music you'll hear that kind of thing how did that go again that actually sounds like most of the music i listen to yeah it kind of does. <laughs> yeah so if you're listening to dubstep or like 8 bit tunes which I won't even notice then. Yeah, you wouldn't notice. You might even think like, wow, this, like, cool there's drop. so much more here that I'm hearing that I never heard before. And it's actually, <laughs> this amp is awesome. <laughs> and it's actually just your cell phone, <laughs> but you got to look at the length to it. it. It just looks cool. It glows. I mean, it, it's, it's the coolness factor entirely. All right, Joe, what are your picks? All right. So my first pick is there's a new train album out and I really like it. I've listened to it several times and I enjoyed it every time. If I listen to it again, I assume I'm going to enjoy it that time as well. <laughs> so I'll pick the new train album. There's a new TV show that just started, Star Wars Rebels. Cartoon show on Disney XD, and they just had episode three yesterday. So by the time you guys hear it, episode four will have just been out. Love it, but that's mostly because it's Star Wars. And much like an Apple fanboy, I will buy anything that George Lucas does as long as it's shiny. Even though he's not doing it anymore, it's <laughs> no Disney. <laughs> so I might be a little bit biased. Yes, I did. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I, I, I may or may not have named my son with the middle name of Anakin. Oh, no. <laughs> so I could be biased, but I, I do love the cartoon. Oh, Joe. And I'm great. so excited for that and all the other Star Wars material that's now coming out. I thought George Lucas was going to have to die for me to get more Star Wars movies. Yeah, and, you, you didn't have to kill him. I didn't. I, I was. I actually had that plan. You know, it was in the early alpha phases. But <laughs> and my final pick is a new conference that myself and some friends have put together called LoopConf, which is a conference for WordPress developers. It's going to be held in May down outside of Vegas in Henderson, Nevada, at a little resort, a nice resort, and it's going to be awesome. Tickets will be going on sale in several weeks. The call for papers is open now. So if you are a WordPress developer, please submit a paper. We'd love to have you. Awesome. Dave, what are your picks? All right. I have two picks for you today. First of all, in my ongoing mission to Vim the world, I have another Vim plugin called Git Gutter. This is a cool little plugin that takes the left-hand side of your editor and marks it for lines that you have changed and, uh, tells you which lines you've added, which lines you've modified, and where you have deleted lines, which is really handy as you're moving around in your file to jump back to where you were working. You can say, oh, I added that line since I committed last. It's probably my favorite Vim plugin of all time, which is saying a lot. Hey, just FYI, vimtheworld.com is available. <laughs> <laughs> In case you want to pick it up. That's a good idea. Yeah. Then, okay, my second pick and final pick is a book called Hidden Like Anne Frank. 14 True Stories of Survival. This author tracked down 14 people who survived the uh, World War II, uh, the Holocaust, effectively, by hiding themselves as children from the uh, Nazis. And the stories are just so cool. There's 14 short stories in the book, and they're really fun to read. And they most of them, I think, 
if not all of them, come from the Netherlands. It's not a place I've generally read about, but I'm visiting there next week. And so I wanted to get acquainted with it, and I read this story, and I was not disappointed. It's been really cool. So if you're into World War II history at all, this is a nice introduction to what these people went through as children, and um, it's really cool. I've been reading it to my kids, and they like it a lot, too. So those are my picks. Cool. Awesome. I've got a couple of picks. Uh, these are things that I am currently working on. One of the more common questions I get these days is, how do I start a podcast? Or, I am starting a podcast, and what do I need to do, know, etc.? So, in that vein, I have uh, set up a website called pickuppodcasting.com. And uh, right now it's just uh, hosting a landing page for a webinar that I'm going to be doing. When this comes out, it will be on Friday, meaning you have like two days to find out about it. But I'm going to be emailing out a ton of good stuff and be doing the webinar. If you want to find out, you can either text podcasting to 38470 or you can go to pickuppodcasting.com and sign up for the mailing list and then you get all the good free stuff. So uh, I'm going to pick that. Also, the other question I get pretty frequently is about freelancing. And so we at the Freelancer Show, which is on the same network as this show, are doing a Q&A every month for people who want to go freelance or learn more about freelancing. So if you're interested in that, you can go to freelancersanswers.com. I don't have a, a keyword on a short code for that one yet. But anyway, freelancersanswers.com, just remember that, and we'll do it. We'll answer all your questions. You show up. It's on a Google Hangout that you watch on the landing page, and we have a chat room where we chat with the folks on there. So one more, one more webinar. I, I forgot to mention, but this one is very pertinent to this show. I actually got a hold of all the people who do, uh, or some of the people who do Ionic, uh, Famous. Um, I'm still reaching out to some of the folks who do phone gap and uh, cordoba and some of the other javascript mobile development frameworks and i'm going to put together a round table so keep an ear out for that i don't have a website up for it yet but i will soon it'll be at the beginning of november so we'll 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 uh, announce that as well those are my picks cool yeah i don't have anything else so uh this was fun i'm glad we had this time together Oh, thanks. All right, we'll wrap this up, and we'll catch you all next week. This episode is sponsored by Raygon.io. If at any point your application is crashing, what would that cost you? Lost users, customers, revenue? Raygun is an essential tool for every developer. Raygun takes minutes to integrate, and you'll be notified of your software bugs as they happen with automatic notifications, a full stack trace to detect, diagnose, and fix errors in record time. Raygun works with all major mobile and web programming languages in a matter of minutes. Try it for free today at raygun.io. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you wish you could be part of the discussion on JavaScript Jabber? Do you have a burning question for one of our guests? Now you can join the action at our membership forum. You can sign up at javascriptjabber.com slash jabber, and there you can join discussions with the regular panelists and our guests. 